Okay, well guys, it is 10.01. Um, people are obviously filtering in as they filter in, but thank you everyone who's here for um, making the time to join us today. I'm super excited to bring this incredible of presenters today um, to talk about all things dashboard related. My name is Jay Wilson. I am a content creator at Data Crew, um, and our goal is to bring the Domo community voices from the Domo community and just have an engaged content about all of the things. But before we kick off with our pr first presenter, I was kind of thinking this morning that I wanted to ask if they differentiate between analytics and reporting and how that might look different as I put my dashboard together or consider what set of tools I might use in Domo, since we all use Domo. Chris, why don't we go ahead and kick off? Chris, are you, what do you do? What do you get excited about? And do you see a difference between reporting and analytics? Sure. Uh, so Jay, thanks for inviting us. Um, just as a quick background, my name is Chris Willis. I'm the Chief Design Officer at Domo and helped start the, um, the uh, platform years ago with Josh James and, and Darren Thane. So excited to be here. Um, so the question you ask, I think is important. And I think it leads to a deeper question, which is yes. So, um, you know, where reports are uh, meant to be used are where there's more of a story that needs to be told. And I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And I think sometimes, you know, reporting and analytics gets kind of blended. Um, but if it, it's hard to distinguish, I think, especially if you don't know how the data is going to be used, because it's all data, right? It's ultimately the, the form it takes is just, you know, an expectation. What we want to do is ultimately understand how are we interfacing the important aspects of how we measure our business to how people need to think about and make decisions. And that's how I make that distinction. That's how I think about, about that topic. Oh, interesting. So spoiler alert, my opinion on it. <laughs> yeah. I always think of that like you can only build a report once you know what's important. And in order to know what's important, you kind of have to analyze how your business works and understand how your business works. And that's kind of where the analysis comes in. Yep. Um, and I, it's interesting because, you know, we've all worked on different projects or worked with different organizations that maybe did or did not know what was important. And so then there becomes this question of like, how do I rapidly iterate on this report that my boss said was important, but just kidding, nope, the KPI we selected was not important. We need to go pivot onto another thing. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that Domo allows us well and very quickly. Um, but I guess, do you have any ideas or insights on how we can run a project more effectively to minimize some of that iteration? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you at all, uh, what you're saying. It is an iterative process. Um, and, and in some ways, you're kind of talking about a chicken versus egg kind of problem, right? right. So I, I've seen that sort of distinction um, run into issues many times before. So, you know, I think, I think ultimately what you're getting at is, you know, if we have the platform, we have the tools, we have the data, why is it, why is it not automatically making us more successful? Right. And, um, you know, as we were sort of talking about earlier, I think a lot of us end up in this situation when you're trying to support decision makers in the organization, um, you're looking for sort of a very clear understanding or or directive and you think you have it but the way they communicate maybe what they're looking for <laughs> or what's missing is is imprecise and yet mm -hmm. you have to deliver very precise data products right that's that's a problem um so the way we we get around that is by usually at, at domo when we're consulting with people is we apply better design thinking to that. And that's that's inherently an iterative process. And what it means is we know that there are many more ways to get something wrong than there are to get it right. It's, there's, it's not a 50-50. Uh, so I think that's like the first assumption that we have to sort of get over, which is there are many more ways to get something wrong. So how do we get there? How do we kind of lead confidently into the unknown and bring others with us, right? Because we know we can get there. And I think a lot of that comes from understanding at the very high level, and you're, you're talking about this with like, hey, I've got the analytics, we know what analytics are important, we think, 
until we put it in front of the person. If they don't see the value, then that's a that's a miss. And it comes from, I think, at its core, understanding that this is an organization that has different people at different levels with different roles who look at the business and look at their use of data in different ways. I see this all okay. the time. Yeah. So so the biggest oversight or miss that I see constantly is you have people at doing analysis or you have people doing analysis at different levels in the organization that then all of a sudden, you know, they get demo or they get some other tool and they're like, oh, create a new dashboard for us. And it's like, well, we'll just make it pretty, right? Like I, as a designer, I don't know if anyone else has heard that as a designer, but usually that's the directive. Really what make it pretty means is figure it out figure out how to make this data a better tool for me to make better decisions. Unfortunately, the understanding amongst the different levels is not aligned, right? And, and what I mean by that is every level of the business uses data in a different kind of way because their role is different and the way they think they're bringing value to the business is different. So at the high level, the L1s, L2s, L3s, the C level, think in story. Right. This is where I think, Jay, to your point, a more like report type design makes a lot of sense because it has context. Um, it has a certain kind of structure and a story. And that story should interface well with where the business is trying to go. Right. There's the analytical, which is I want to get in and understand where I think we need to measure the business uh, in a way that ultimately will be impactful at all different levels. And then you get the people who are using data to get work done or make better decisions on the fly. And that's the operational and the tactical. And so you go from very broad type data stories and experiences to very narrow, specific, task-focused type applications. One of the uh, things I, yeah. I made for a moment. Yeah, one of the things I pointed out when I was asked to present on this topic was that um, you were saying like different people need different data, right? And so the, I think you said L1 through L3s, they need kind of, people might call them lagging indicators, like percent change. Our profit margins percent, our profit margin yeah. changed this much from the previous month. And if I'm, if I'm Joe Bloggs, a line of business worker, I, I, profit margin isn't as important to me as, well, how many units of this did I sell or how many units of inventory do I have in stock? But these things kind of have an impact downstream on profit margin. Um, and Absolutely. so sometimes I think it's important to keep in mind that um, the KPIs that we're asked to track, they might be, they might seem completely unrelated, but they, they do have an impact. And I guess kind of mapping all that together is a bit so of a I'm going to jump ahead because you, you you kind of jumped to my end. Oh. <laughs> my bad. Oh, that's okay. I love it. Um, so so yeah, I you know we can do this in any order, but that's that's ultimately where we kind of go wrong is that there's not a, a full understanding of of how the data makes a dollar. How, sorry, how the business makes a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. That that's how I kind of untangle what a business does and how we can provide better analytics at all different levels, which is, you know, ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, you've got revenue and you've got costs, right? Now, those might be lagging indicators to your point, because everything else, a lot of things have to happen before you get those numbers. Mm -hmm. so you have to break that down and go like, okay, so where's the revenue coming from? And how is the money being spent? And then to your point, well, those ultimately become tactical type applications. And so one of the things we do is when we go into a, an organization and, and sometimes they're like, we feel kind of stuck, we have to look at how to map the data to their organization, how their, how their uh, organization is making money and also how it's organized. And then ultimately how each one of those individuals is using that data to make better decisions. We call that pushing decisions to the edges. That's ultimately how organizations use data to transform far more quickly by creating new kinds of data products and new kinds of data experiences from those data products. Um, and then when in doubt, <laughs> understand like, well, what is it that somebody wants to get done? We call this jobs to be done or purpose, a purpose-driven design. Um, so anyway, yeah, kind of jumped ahead there, but that's, that's exactly, that intuition is absolutely right. 
And so the design thinking and the design process around uh, creating new kinds of reports or dashboards or applications has to be iterative by its nature and has to be focused on jobs to be done for that level. What we typically see is where things get confusing is the language doesn't exist to have that collaboration. Mm -hmm. Understanding is missing. So you almost need people to say, oh, we're gonna take a step back and let's really understand like how, how does data kind of move through the organization? How are decisions made? And how do those decisions sort of roll up? That's why, you know, I sort of the over simplification is how do we make a dollar is important. Because um, right. usually what happens is people get very myopic and they focus on their silo. And what we've seen, um, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier uh, before this was we've seen companies go and say, we're going to take a very analytical approach. We're going to create 800 KPIs. We're just going to cover everything we think is important. Well, in fact, we think we not only think we know it's important because we've been doing this forever. And then they create all the dashboards and say, here are all the KPIs and no one cares. Why? Because they don't see it as a solution to their problem. They don't see that data as telling them the story that helps them get their job done. And so you, you almost have to take that sort of high level approach to begin to organize and then start simply, right? With like, what can we do to get success quickly because success becomes addictive many times people take a, a a very sort of boil the ocean approach like the 800 kpis all at once and just say if we build it they will come it doesn't happen it doesn't happen because yeah to scott's point here you have to ask questions and honestly sometimes even asking questions isn't enough because right. they, they they don't know there's a you almost run into a, um the limitations of imagination and the reason you have to start focusing so much on jobs to be done is because, um, and I, I wish there was a, a, a term for this, but people are often um, guided by their pain. So there might be something like, here's this, until this pain is soothed, I can't think beyond it. That pain might be, I've got to get this PowerPoint out, or I've got to create a new report, or I've got this problem with our social media spend, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Until you can help me with that, I can't really think beyond it. Chris, so, just sorry to interrupt. I yeah, mean, I, no, go ahead. So we are we are kind of reaching that the end of that ten minutes that I've allocated yeah, yeah, to speak, sure. but we do have some time for Q and A. Speaking to this idea that the executive sponsor for a project might have different KPIs that they're interested in yeah. versus the uh, metrics that may actually move the needle on that number. Do you have any tools and tricks for someone who might be an analyst who might actually have to question their boss, hey, is this the right number? Are we sure about that? That might be an uncomfortable place to be yes. if you're talking to your SVP and be like, mm, I'm not sure if we're measuring the thing that you think you want to be measuring. Um, other than having <laughs> an external consultant come in, um, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah. So. A few things. Um, so you're absolutely right. I, I gave a, a chat recently um, at um, the MBA school, the Sloan School over at MIT, and and this exact problem came up because understanding your audience is really important. So if it's you know an executive and maybe they're the, the sponsor, right, and you're supporting them and you want them to be successful, you have to talk to them a little bit differently. And I would say not all of us are completely equipped at the start to maybe do that. Right, because you have to be able to you like not to borrow from your background, but you have to be a bit of a unicorn in that sense, right? You have to be able to speak the language of the business at the different levels. So you have to understand how are they looking at the business, what's the language they use around it, and then you have to get to your point: how can I um, serve you better? And the way we do that is by understanding what keeps you up at night, what are your pain points, Ooh, what are the that. things that worry you. Right. If you could sort of set it aside, let's talk about what ifs. And I did this just this week with a CEO of a, of a large bank, 77,000 people, and tried to say, like, forget building everything. Let's think about the one thing that keeps you up at night. What kept you up uh, this week? And he's like, what keeps me up at night is our customers because of the way we do reporting and the way we understand our analytics and the way that we haven't been able to service ourselves, 
know more about what's lacking in our organization than we do. They have a different view. They have a broader view of where we're doing well and where we're doing poorly. And I'm reacting. I only find out about this when something goes wrong. I would love to know what's going wrong. I just want to know it before they do so I can be proactive. Right. And I was like, oh, great. What's the one metric that we, that we could start using that would help tell you that? And there was one. <laughs> that may not always be the case, but now all of a sudden you're like, you've unlocked the conversation and you've opened the door to collaboration. Chris, and that's you're awesome. Gonna you're gonna learn on the way. Thank you so much. This video was sponsored by the guys over at Argo Analytics. You'll recognize the faces behind Argo Analytics as the founders of Crystal Ballers. And that's because it's the same guys, just different branding. Um, and yeah, they still are really freaking good. Um, but more importantly, they're just guys that I trust. If I have a data pipeline question, if I have some sort of an architecture question that I'm trying to muddle, I'll just reach out to John or Andrew for advice. Argo Analytics was founded by former Domo employees. In fact, many of their staff are former Domo employees, which really explains why they know the platform so, so well. Doc was a major Domo at Domo and so was responsible for a lot of the content management, keeping track of PDP, making sure that there were no data leaks, you know, the stuff that we worry about every day when we're dealing with Domo. And I think that's probably why Argo Analytics has such a strong focus on the major Domo experience. By the way, he has a PhD, so no big deal. <laughs> when he says he knows data science, yeah, John really knows data science. The other co-founder, Andrew, was a solutions consultant at Domo and then the director of the data science program before he left Domo to start Argo Analytics. It's not just about being good at Domo administration or data engineering or custom apps. It's the whole ball of wax that they're all incredibly good at. And what I really appreciate about John and Andrew is that they're not just good at Domo. We all recognize that Domo is one piece within your enterprise stack. And what John and Andrew have done really well is figured out where to position their Domo consulting services and products and how all of these things can play together or if there's opportunities to remove duplication of effort. In any case, don't take my word for it. Give them a call, let them know that I sent you and uh, you know, good luck on your project. Okay. Um, so Devin, as I promised everyone, I was gonna ask um, if they see a difference between analytics and reporting and how that might change how they shape or prepare their content in Domo. So first off, thank you for ch making the time to join us, um, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I. Um... I have always felt strongly that we skew a little too heavily that analytics and reporting are the same. I, I believe they're very different. Um, a, a way I like to think of it is analytics is the exploration and reporting is the consumption of whatever has been discovered in the exploration process. Right. Um, does that mean that all of your data experiences have to be uh, relegated to being a report? No. Um, in fact, Domo has some great tools that allow you to, to dive into a report to do some more exploration. In fact, we have a tool called Explorer that's kind of meant for that. Um, if you're on a report or a dashboard, you can uh, open up the Explorer and dive deeper, add extra filters, uh, do drill paths, like discover additional information there on the spot. And then you could leave a comment, say, hey, we should add this or message someone who's in charge of that dashboard or something like that. But um, I, I wanted to um, kind of relate back to something that Chris was talking about where data experiences start um, you know, pretty uh, focused or broad, um, depending on who the user is. Um, and that means that your data experience or your dashboard, whatever, whatever you want to call your data experience, um, really needs to be tailored to the needs of the user. And discovering what those needs are is that jobs to be done concept that Chris was talking about. And asking questions, diving in, I like to use the five whys um, method of asking questions where if um, you ask them, 
okay, what do you care about? And they say, I care about this. And you say, well, why do you care about that? What about that do you care about? And then they elaborate more. And usually when they elaborate, you can find something within their explanation that's like, well, why is that? And hopefully within five whys, you should get to the root uh, cause of their concern. Um, and then that is the type of thing that you put in your tool chest or your appendix to utilize when you're designing your dashboards or your data experiences is it, they're like Chris said, their, their pain point is the top of their mind when the cause of that pain might be deeper down in some other metric that's in some other data set. Um, so it's important to dig down into those concerns. Um, and then as, you, as you're building your experience, consider following uh, progressive disclosure, meaning for like a, an executive, they only need to see some top KPIs, but you can have some buttons with the KPI that says, learn more about how we calculate this or learn more about this KPI. They can click that and then they can go to a whole dashboard that splits it all out and gives you all kinds of analysis and information. So, um, I, I think when you when you open that up, that allows the executive to do more of that analytical activity if they truly want to. But I've discovered that often the executive doesn't. Um, they they want it on a platter. They want an answer that they can run with. And so one of the mantras that I've kind of adopted more recently is that sometimes the best interface is no interface at all. So when you're thinking about an executive, for example, do they actually need a dashboard at all? Or do they just need an email that they get once a week that gives them the numbers they need? Or an alert that you've built on top of the data set that's watching for you know, some sort of a bench benchmark to be reached, and then they get a text on their phone that might be the data experience that the executive needs, not a dashboard at all. And luckily, Domo can do all of those things, um, especially like the alerting that Domo has built in. You can set an alert on a data set and a card. And those alerts are so powerful because you can um, send a text to someone that has a really meaningful message um, if you're doing that, that analysis for them. Uh, but if you take a step back and a step further, it's like, Often you are asked to create a dashboard, regardless of whether or not it's the right thing for them to have. You're asked, I need a dashboard or I need a set of dashboards. Um, so um, I've I put together a little list of, of the five ways to make sure that your dashboard is successful um, and that you can decrease the amount of iterations as possible. Um, yeah. but um, we'll talk a little bit about how to deal with that that iteration process okay the first step is you've got to understand what the jobs to be done are for each of the different target user groups from the executive to the gm to the um the individual analyst or the head of a department whatever it might be you need to understand what jobs they're trying to get done on any given day there's a lot of methods to figure out what those jobs are but um, one of the things that helps people to feel like they're participating um, in this uh, uh, activity of, of figuring out what their needs are is to do like a, a card sorting exercise or something along those lines where you collect all of the questions and answers that, that they have, you put them up on the board, and then you categorize them by job to be done. Um, and after you've done that categorization, what 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 you do is you take the next step of trying to organize all of that learning into some sort of navigation that will help guide people through the experience and that kind of goes back to that uh, progressive disclosure uh, discussion i had a few minutes ago is it's really important to um, understand the flow that the user needs to go through um, and i've seen a lot of people or a lot of customers and even people here at Domo, um, they utilize the, the dashboard sidebar um, to kind of organize all of their content. And um, that wasn't necessarily the intent of 
that sidebar, um, the sidebar was really meant to be just a bucket of all of your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and once you've got all of your, you can organize it to kind of keep sanity. But ultimately, the goal is that your dashboards should have its own navigation within it. So we we added links. We added link to any content in Domo. We added link to anything external, uh, files to download, all that type of stuff. And so what we've seen a lot is people will do a, a landing page for their group of dashboards or their reporting experience. Um, and then you can, that's kind of their starting point. And that's where you have the progressive disclosure where they can choose how deep they want to go from there. And then once they get on one of those dashboards, you have some links across the top that let them go to the other dashboards that are within that category or that are related to the job they're trying to get done. So those two methods, I think, are really important to help them get guided through the, through the experience. Uh, the third step is to make sure that you're gathering all of the content. Um, you've probably heard in the past the phrase mobile first design. It was really big in like the 2010s. Um, and the problem is, is that that's so narrowly focused. What, what, the, what the moniker should be is content first design. So if you don't understand what the content is that needs to be on the dashboard, don't even start designing it, what it looks like, how it's organized. You gotta see what the breadth of content is, and then you can organize it by job to be done. And so then- Just to jump in real quick. I, I know when layouts and pages were first making their kind of debut, I don't know, 2018, one of the things we were really excited about was I could quickly put a wireframe together with fake data of what my future chart might look like. When you're working with a customer, with a, an executive sponsor or even a team that you're trying to implement a dashboard for, do you have any quick and dirty tools that you use for like mocking up what your wireframe might look like? It's something we always say we should do, but we sometimes right. are not doing. Um, so there is a fine line between having the content built already right. versus knowing what the content is. So um, when you're creating a dashboard, you, I actually like to lay out the dashboard and I'll put in just notebook cards and label it as this is going to be this card. Ooh, okay. Once it's built, I know the data is available. I just need to go build the card. But at the very least, you kind of know what's going on. So I'll lay out a dashboard using just notebook cards and headers and things like that. Okay. Um, and then once I've kind of felt settled on that, I, I like to go talk to a stakeholder and be like, okay, is this kind of what you're thinking? Like, would this be helpful to you? Give them the scenario that you discovered in your jobs to be done exercise of, okay, you've got this thing that you need to do. You, you, you told me you need to do this all the time. Um, go to this dashboard and tell me if it's helping you. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get that feedback early and you realize, okay, too many uh, charts or too many KPIs or something like that. Um, so you go through that exercise of, of constructing the dashboard based on the content. You're not really thinking about aesthetics yet. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people get caught up in um, is they feel like they're presenting to an executive. So they have to make it look nice. And then they put in dummy data and they do other stuff and they build something that actually doesn't matter. Um, in the end, it's or it's too much or it's not enough. Um, so trying to get feedback early before you've taken the effort to actually build the cards is helpful by just putting placeholders in, but you know the data. That's the important part. Don't just lay it out and be like, this is kind of what it's going to look like. That's not helpful because once you start creating the charts and the data, you might realize, oh, I, I can't even create that um, because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that step. Um, and then once you've done that step and you feel comfortable with the layout um, or it, sorry jump the gun with the content that's available then you can start focusing on the detail of visual hierarchy so right. you know thinking about how big something is um how how uh high how top how close it is to the top of the page what its color is like how much contrast it has versus other parts of the page 
that visual hierarchy step is the last thing you do. Mm. The, you really need to understand the content before you get to that stage. And I think that's what happens a lot with when you're working with an executive sponsor is, is people jump the gun and jump to layout and what the, what it looks like before they get the feedback of this is actually going to answer their question or, or help them get their job done faster. On that note of visual hierarchy and how things are laid out, Rachel, I think we've got you next on the docket to present a little bit about how you approach designing and laying out the dashboard so it does look pretty. Um, but before we get there, I did again want to ask you about your thoughts on a delineation between um, reporting and analytics. And I think just to mix it up a little bit, when you're working with people who have a different set of tool or a reporting requirement or an analytics requirement, do you find yourself, like Devin was saying, leaning more towards alerts and emails um, for these executive people instead in lieu of a dashboard? And for our analysts, are they still exporting to Excel? What's your experience in that space? <clears throat> so I feel like I kind of use a combination of both. We do a lot of emailed reports. Um, and I, I like to use automation a lot um, to help me and also to help the executives that I work for and work with. Um, I have found that there, there, there are reports just coming in, it's constantly pulling reports and then just my main job is just trying to make sure that the things that, the things that they use to actually make decisions is what they is what they're seeing so they we can have all the reports that we want that have tons and tons of data and it's just like okay that's not what you need the decision you're trying to make is not is not where you're looking so i really prefer scaling everything down and just saying i need to know what decision you're trying to make before before you ever try to get into a report and see like oh i know i want all of these things eh, what decision are you trying to make because then i can tell you how to get there um if you're trying if you're if your focus is i want to know where my company stands like going top down the further down you go the more uh as far as like the positions in the company those people need to know you know, when you get down in your supervisory positions, they need more granularity. They need to actually know those things. At the very top, there there's less there. So it's like more of a combination of, are you trying to make decisions or just get an idea of where you stand? Uh, are, we, are we up or down? <laughs> so um, that's kind of most, everything is contextual, con context, context-based. I can't say that word. <laughs> Contextual. I love that. I love that differentiation between do you just want to know where we stand or do you need to make a decision right now? Like that's 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 super interesting. So um, the email reports are typically do I I want to know where we stand. That's every day I'm checking in how are we doing. Um, the dashboards are for people who need to make decisions mostly is what I'm finding. Right. Is my stock portfolio going up or down or am I going to buy a new stock? I love that. That's, that's yeah. so cool. Um, yeah, Rachel, you mentioned that you had some, well, other people have waxed on lyrically about how great your design skills are. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of share with the, with the community some of the things you think about as you're approaching design um, of these dashboards, because the hardest part for me especially, because I do not care, could not care less about what a dashboard looks like. How can I make my dashboards prettier? Okay, so the first thing that everybody should know is a lot of people don't know that they care what it looks like until they see something terrible. And they're like, ugh. <laughs> um, great design is rarely appreciated as much as it should be because great design is focused on making the data important, not the design. So, um, Keeping things simple is the most important thing. Uh, the the big design thing that I had recently, it was back in the uh, orientation. I'm going to share just um, the difference in a couple of things. Um, let's see. Can everybody see this? Yeah. 
Yes, looks great. Yeah, okay. So this is um, just like a sample something that I built in the um, in the orientation. And um, the, the main thing about choosing color, I'm just gonna be more color focused right now, um, is in choosing colors, the colorblind, you have, I always think, will someone who's colorblind be able to tell the difference? And I don't have it committed to memory. I always have to look up like which colors can they see and what can they not see and, and where's the contrast there. Um, so I always try to keep that in the back of my mind. The reason I like single color designs is that they always look really modern and sleek. So someone who's not a designer, if you're a data person, who's like, I hate dealing with design because it's not my thing. Go a single color and just different values because anybody can tell what's important. So um, help data people develop a design mindset. So right, so yeah, design does not come, I hated design until I found data, until I realized dashboards involved design and then I love design. I went to school for design and hated it with a fiery passion. I was like, what's the point? It's just pretty, but there's no point. Well, the data gives it a point. So um, now the idea is with this uh, particular dashboard here, um, there's a reason why tents are all the same value and everything is lower. You just, you want to find an identifier there and keep um, your color identifying the same thing consistently, um, as opposed to something like this, where it's pretty, the colors all go together well, um, but, and, and I kept it consistent, right? So like gray is on top all the way across and sure it looks consistent, but it doesn't mean anything. Visually, you can't tell what's important because they're all the same value. They all have the same brightness. So when you think about design and what you're wanting to do, refresh a page and notice what you look at first. It's going to be the most, the, the color with the most value in it. So here, um, I specifically left a background off of uh, the top section in order to separate that out. This is one whole section that's an overall general view. And then as we move down, only the important um, things have the, the biggest value. And I started um, on this side with the most revenue and then kept that value consistent moving through the charts. So where you want consistency is with the value, not with just keeping every, this is technically all the same, but it doesn't matter. It's not putting importance on the numbers. Rachel, can, if I could just jump in for a second. I So I went through Domo's battle school program for Domo consultants, right? And one of the things that they kind of promote is they say, instead of having a, a, a title for a graph like revenue or by category, they would say, have the question that people are supposed to be able to answer by looking at this chart. Like I should know what piece of, what nugget of gold I'm trying to pull out of this. And maybe I'm just trying to pull out total revenue, but I was wondering, and maybe I'll ask this to every, all of the speakers present, if they have a strong opinion one way or another about these titles that tell me what I'm supposed to get up. Tell me what you're going to tell me before you tell me. I, I don't, I don't know what the sales thing is, but um, Rachel, let me start with you. Do you have a strong opinion on that um, about naming your cards with a question or, or assuming that you know the question people want to answer? Uh, yeah, um, I like to name cards really based strongly on, my, on, on the audience. So even though in the data, well, that's not technically what that's called. Right. Like based on my column name and be like, I don't care if they can't tell what it is then the name serves zero purpose. Mm -hmm. So there's one, uh, there's one particular metric I have with a client that's called something totally different in when I'm actually looking at the data and doing the data engineering. Mm -hmm. And I have to call it something that means not what it is on a card, because if it doesn't, it has to mean something to them. They're the one that's looking at it and making the decision. It's my job to wrap it up in a way that they can use it. So, <sighs> 
those that's that's something where you really have to know the client and get them to tell you what the industry standard and what the terms are for for whoever your client is as far as a designer goes yeah. so as a data engineer if you're good at getting information from people that that matters a lot Devin, did you have a hot take on how you name your cards and axes and all of that? Yeah, I I typically like to name them based on the job that they're trying to get done with that uh, chart or or uh, uh, notebook card. Um, I also really like trying to include dynamic text so that it means more to the individual user. Um, because you can have the text change based on who they are, um, based on what filters they have applied. Right. Um, that way, the, the title uh, means more than just a static element. Mm -hmm. And Chris, what about you? Yeah, uh, I, a few of the things that Rachel talked about really echo with me. Uh, one is, I think what she's getting at is you, you have to get good at kind of being a you know, like, in, you know, maybe in this case, like a, a CEO whisperer, right? You have to learn how to speak that person's language. Mm -hmm. and you have to figure out how to translate the, what your, the data and how it's being measured to how they understand how it's being measured. Because to their point, they may not be using maybe industry standard stuff, mm -hmm. but this is part of a, a longer process, which is one, they have to see the value in it, right? They have to see the work you've done as being a solution to their problem. And so you might have to create a more personalized data experience right. versus, you know, it'd be great if there was, you know, some agreed upon metric or data dictionary where everything, everyone agreed to these terms, but usually you're not starting there. That's what mm -hmm. you're, you're working towards. Mm -hmm. And so being able to say, oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I liked uh, Devin's tip earlier, which was, what does this KPI mean? That's what we would call a didactic approach which is you're using the, yeah, you're using the, the data and the opportunity and the design to teach, right? So you may call it this, or this is an answer to this question, which is a great way to speak, I think, or present data to executives. Like, what is this telling me? What's the value of it? How do I use it? When you're going into other parts of the organization where it's more operational or tactical, well, they just want the, they just want the label for the most part, you know, like, Mm -hmm. cost per click what is that right uh, okay, so I see. I see. That, that's that's how i would look at it so yeah i've definitely seen seen that many times Jason, i'm gonna i'm gonna get to your answer in a moment i just wanted to highlight everyone so this was elliot's idea to put this session together so make sure to thank elliot on the side but one of the things elliot you mentioned as we were going through this is you're like okay well you know as a as a data engineer or as a person who's doing visualization or being a consultant right what what does my responsibility become as more of this job gets easier and easier and i think everyone who has spoken so far has kind of highlighted now our job doesn't just have to be i'm a data person my job can be i'm a design thinking consultant or i'm a person who's going to help the organization understand what's really important to my business and that's not even a data question that's just like a a, a consulting analyst type question. And so I do think there's really interesting opportunities for us as people, as Domo people going out into the world and our organizations that we work in to just have a broader understanding of how a business works and operates. Um, but this tangent went on for a bit. Jason, like I said, I'm gonna follow up with you and ask you your question about um, how your preference for title in a moment. But Rachel, before, before we end your session, were there any other nuggets that you wanted to share with us? As far as sharing uh, some some tips for a domo, block things out Ooh. with color. So I used this whole, this is just a portion of a dashboard that I used. And in order to separate it from another portion of a das dashboard, put a text block here with a, with a background color. So, um, and then using a, I used a gradient light to dark as the background. A lighter color draws your eye first. So I want them to start here and move this way through the dashboard. Mm -hmm. And then I left these here to kind of show, um, I believe Devin was talking earlier about putting what goes in cards. This one, this is still in um, in progress here. But uh, anyways, I you, gradients are great for this kind of thing where you can lead their eye starting light to dark and going that direction. And then 
splitting things up side by side, one color on this side, one color on that side. This is all of my domestic statistics and all of my international shipping statistics. Um, and so that's another way you can kind of use and then break it up. Uh, the more complex your data, the more simple your color scheme needs to be. Otherwise, it's just distracting. So that's all I wanted to say there. Uh, Rachel, Thank you. I really appreciate this. Oh, man. Hey, so you mentioned that you, I think, went to school for, for design. Do you, do you or anyone, um, Chris, Devin, and co, do you guys have any resources that you might point a person to and be like, this is the book. This is the book you need to read as you're thinking about dashboard design. Yeah. I have a couple that I always recommend. Yeah, Scott um, Baronado, and I'll, I'll put that in the link and I'll send it to you after, Jay. But so what I love about this is it's not just about making a great chart, but it's about how you should think about data and the different ways to visualize it to get jobs done. So cool. am I in exploratory mode? Am I in just sort of an awareness mode, right? Like I, um, so data can be used in many, many different ways. I'll get my affiliate link set up, so. <laughs> yes, get that, get that done first. Get your Amazon affiliate set up first before I, I send this out. You know, I think, I think in some ways, just because, you know, we're visual creatures, we assume that the design part is fairly easy. It's like, I can see things, I can appreciate things. Yeah. Why can't I create things? Yep. And that's that's the gap, right? That's the gap that you need to slowly start um, bridging. Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to put your presentation together. Jason, over to you. The question was, when you are going about naming your cards in a dashboard or naming the beast modes and fields, do you go with the, this is the title of the asset or um, try to address what people are supposed to get out of this, what they're supposed to be answering with this card? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, and maybe I'll answer the first question you had as well really quickly. I think in the shortest way possible for me, when I think about analytics and I think about reporting, I think about reporting as like a snapshot in time, right? Like how's my portfolio today? Like you mentioned, that is only really valuable today or maybe like looking back historically, like, wow, on that day, right? I was doing well, but it doesn't really have the same impact today as it did when I got that push notification or that email or that alert. So anyway, when I think about those two experiences, right, it's like, what do I need to know right now, this moment, um, I should look at it, you know, right now, or maybe it's a snapshot, like a quarterly report. It's always useful, right? I go back and look at uh, a company's quarterly report to know how they were doing at that moment in time and compare it against now, right? And then that, and that already becomes analytics, right? Where I start to look at those two timeframes independently. But when I want to look at a specific snapshot, a specific moment, that's what I'm doing. When I think about cards and card titles, um, this is actually why, again, you're, uh, when we think about these things, how I present something to someone and how I name it for my own purposes of organization and findability are kind of two different things. So I find myself in dashboards, like removing the card titles a lot and adding my own card titles using the descriptions or the dynamic text options of a notebook card. Um, sometimes I will put multiple cards together that are related, right? So I've got like a summary number and a chart and I'll show that really quickly here as well. Um, but the title only needed to show up once, right? So I might name the card something that's more for me to find it and put it on the right pages and use it, right? But then how it shows up in the context of the dashboard is really, I think when you think about uh, chat GPT and AI and all the things that are allowing us to build more content more quickly, the secret sauce is you and everyone on the call going in and like being the executive whisperer Chris is talking about, being an active listener, listening to what it is that people are saying, how they're terming it, how what are the words that relate to them and how they use those words, and then putting that in front of them as the axes and the chart names and everything so that they interpret the chart as quickly as possible. And that that's the thing that like AI can't do the same, right? It can come up with like its best guess, but like you're the one who's sitting there listening to them, hearing what their company's using, the terms that they're using, how that maps up to an industry term, and then making an educated decision to say, okay, is that something that I should put in there or should I teach them the better word, right? The more industry standard mm -hmm. word, because that's going to help them search it and and think about it in other places in other ways. Like these Very good. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Google, right? Like it's a great example of 
uh, as Domo gets bigger and like more people participate in the community, we start to have better like search results and findability, right? But in the early days, it's like, what is beast mode? And you can't just like search it, right? You can't just get those results. Um, so same thing, if it's a specific company specific term, they're not gonna be able to find it uh, if they were to go and search somewhere outside of their business. But if they're already using that terminology and it's prolific inside of an organization, then it's a shame not to put it right there in front of them where it's understandable. Um, Cool. Well, let me uh, run through. We've got a couple of things. I gave a presentation uh, right before Domo Palooza on top 10 tricks for beautiful dashboards in Domo. Let's talk about three uh, because that's the time that we probably have. And some of these are new things that are since Domo Palooza. So it's kind of updated. Uh, I wanted to piggyback off of what Rachel was saying because um, totally, totally believe this. Don Norman, attractive things work better, or at least we think they do. So uh, yeah, it, you don't think it matters always, but it totally matters, right? Um, so this is this is good. Anyway, top three uh, tricks for more beautiful dashboards. The first one I want to talk about was more dynamic KPIs. So Rachel showed some really great KPIs in there. This is one of the things that uh, these are all KPI charts, just using the multi-value KPI chart, vanilla and Domo and they all look very different. We're just using different chart properties and options. I had a ton of people come to me. This was the demo that I did um, back in March. Uh, this together, this workup, that's just a KPI card with a chart with a notebook card. You can see it's just has some KPIs right there in line. Um, and you can add hyperlinks. So like the C order performance, that's just a hyperlink to another page. Um, those numbers in there are just KPI charts, right? Um, and, and so, can I add something there, Jason? Because I really yeah. love what you did was you're you're not, a lot of times we tend to sort of like put everything in its own little spot, right? Like there's the navigation thing and then there's the data thing and then there's the explanatory stuff. But putting it together so that somebody could look at this and say, oh, you know what? Not only do I have, you know, the the chart, right? The, the visual, but I have... Uh, to Devin's point, sometimes the best chart isn't a chart. It's the text that tells me how to think about it. So there's the framing aspect of it. And then it's the navigation is built right in. So I have a question. I don't have to go hunt to where to fight, figure out how to go deeper, go into those details, go down, you know, um, into the, the very specifics. So I, I really like how that's organized. Yeah. Jason, yeah. just for me, can you put this in design? Well, so the 503 million, that, that's a... Well, that's a KPI card with a single with a transparent background. Yep, with a transparent background. The chart cards have a white background, and then the notebook cards have a transparent background. And that C sales performance is part of the. It's just text. It's just text with the yeah yeah. If I go back, let's see. You're gonna have to give me a screenshot of this and just like this is a that this is a that. that <laughs> yeah, there you go. I hover it, and there's the other one there. So this is a single value. That's a chart, and then this is a notebook, and then you see right here. Yeah. Uh, that right there is just if you go up and you click on hyperlink, right, 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 right. You just put in a URL to the page and it goes right there. Uh, the others are just summary numbers. And then all I'm doing is just doing the coloring uh, by selecting it and changing the color. Um, and that's what's lining those up uh, visually, right? So lots of cool things you can do though with the the chart. If you get in there, um, I think maybe Mark posted the the URL that might be to the video that we did, but I, I I go in and I show how to configure between a couple of those. You know, this is like I said, all of these are done. Uh, it just depends on how you want to use it, right? A lot of these, it's like not actually using the card title or using the metric title at all. We're typing in our own titles, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's instead of just you know sales, we're just typing in the words total sales, and you can do a lot with like the there's words before, words after. You can color those however you want them. Um, and then as you can see, there's like the plus. So sometimes numbers like plus 13, right? It's like we've had this change by 13 units or people versus having an arrow to show a percentage and you can change and make all of those. There's several different choices and options there. Um, so that one's really cool. Uh, uh, that is something that you can do today. That's vanilla demo. I'm going to do a really quick demo of something that we showed at demo Palooza. Um, I did want to highlight really quickly on the backgrounds. Um, you can use Figma or other tools. Uh, that one right there actually is just finding like a black and white image of like kind of those swooshy styles and then throwing it into Figma and um, doing like an overlay 
a blending mode or a multiply blending mode. So you can actually set different colors. Uh, so it was a black image originally that then I'm just like inverting uh, so that I get the black lines instead of white lines. So anyway, you can do a lot of things with just like really simple textures and backgrounds and throwing them into, uh, you know, really simple like photo editing tools and then setting them to different blending modes. You can get lots of really cool effects. You want to do a little short 30 minute with me someday about how to yeah. get started with Vic Figma and doing backgrounds for Domo? Not yeah, doing. for sure. I, and again, like all I did is I went to Mark. They had some images of like some swooshing going on. I think I do a little bit of a demo in the video that was linked where I show like a couple of sample backgrounds that we put together. Um, yeah. A lot of times I, I remove, like you can see in the middle, it's transparent, but it's not, the texture doesn't carry forward. All that is, is we're just blending out, blurring the center section so that you don't right. have that complexity where the content is. Um, so it's pretty useful. Um, okay, themes and styles, whatever you want to see. This is App Studio, right? Um, again, we showed the video of this at Demo Palooza, um, but I want to show something really cool. What we're trying to do is make sure that people can do things really quickly and yeah. easily. So in this, you can see we've got a palette again. I was just trying to recreate the page that we had, but I can change the theme color and it's updating everything really quickly. And our ability to like create customized themes. Uh, here, if I don't like the green, I get some suggestions. I can change this to whatever I want. And we're using design tokens here, right? So it's updating all of those buttons at the same time. It's not go in and change the background color for every notebook card. All of them are updating all at the same time. And then you can pick totally different themes. And then there you go. You've got like a totally different color scheme. You can see like the rounded corners have changed shape uh, when I change different themes and stuff like that as well. So That's lots cool. of really cool things coming in the works. Chris, Rachel, and Jay, well, everyone, do you guys, I know there exists a way of finding, like, here's a color and here are like five complementary color palettes that might work well together. Do y'all have that as a free resource that we can just go to on the internet? Is that something super secret that we have to ask Chris Willis about? Like, does that exist? And can you post a link to it? I know it does, yes. exist. I just have to Google it. I'll post yeah. a link for what I use. Yeah, awesome. there, there's, there's a ton of tools. We already have a tool in Domo that we use for branding, but we're coming up with a version two to make that easier. So um, there are, there's some definitely some strategies and we know that that's a, that's a biggie. And so Jason and I and the team are working on creating a, a new tool just for this App Studio Builder. Um, Premium so, tool or free tool for the community, for everyone? I think, I think it's gonna be for everyone, but it's gonna be essentially the new version of Stories. Jay, I would say the, my, my big takeaway or my big piece of advice would be you want to, if anything, you want to use less color than more in a lot of instances. So I think of it as like a 70, 20, 30. So 70% of your page is going to be sort of neutral background tones, right? And then 20% will be your, your sort of primary type color scheme. And then the last 10% should be for accents. Uh, that's why one of the things I like about the, the Scott Bernadita book around good charts, which is gray is one of the most underused colors in data visualization <laughs> and one of the most important. Um, so anyway, that, that's how I would start. But yeah, I'll let uh, Jason show some of the things that we have. I think this is available in Brand Kit right now, um, which is a paid feature. And again, but the the techniques and the tooling here, we're talking about like what you just showed, what I just showed in App Studio, that's using a lot of the logic and the stuff that went into this to pull it the other direction. Um, but it's got some really great stuff. You know, you can um, make right. adjustments and this is just for creating chart color palettes for your instance, um, which is really great. And like a super useful tool. You can see in this one, like the, the auto generated stuff, if we didn't like it, we can make some adjustments to, uh, you know, fix some of the curves or to um, tweak some of the ratios. But it's right. there's been a lot of really great um, things that Chris has put into this. Um, and and that's what we're pulling forward and uh, trying to make it more usable. I, I showed in the demo too, uh, the ability to change like the chart palette per app so that your app could use a different set of colors in the mm -hmm. chart is something that uh, is definitely part of what we're working on right now. Um, so really quickly, I want to go over DD or uh, demo bricks and uh, something there because uh, 
I know that like several people talked about using them for navigation and I talked about in the presentation. I wanna show something like, again, we're going off script a little bit here in terms of like what normally like constitutes like good design and everything, but when we're talking about dashboards and I think it's the right audience. Um, what I love about Domo the most is our ability to create, you know, really great prototyping experiences, right? There's a lot of times where like, this should be a custom application that we go and develop and we put a lot of time into and IT owns it and everything. But like getting all that data through the pipeline and put into the right places, like that just all takes time. And instead we can wire something up where we can validate that like this is gonna solve the problem of the person that we're trying to help right now in this moment. And we can do that in like five minutes in Domo. So uh, in this example here, um, I have, uh, uh, we had a bunch of stuff in JIRA. We were trying to do a better job of like helping designers like take ownership of the projects they're working on. But engineers were using JIRA. Uh, and they have, you know, their own way of organizing and thinking about things and it wasn't like lining up with ours. And so rather than asking us to like go in and add more labels to JIRA, right, or to a project management software, we said, let's just go and try um, some things out. So what this is, this is just a Domo brick right here, right? And I can link a ticket and I can do some things in here like assign theming or sizes, right? Rather than having a ticket in JIRA, we could go in and say, um, let's look at, let's just say like t-shirt size is extra large, right? Um, and then I can add those. You can see I've done that for a couple of these here, but then what I'm doing is just joining that in a data set view to the original source data. And now I can go in and write a couple of case statements, right? Where it passes through or it takes the original value if an override value isn't present. Um, and we can really prototype some cool effects uh, without having to go back and like figure out how to get that data through the pipeline just to try out a really simple experience or or something that we think is going to be helpful to people to use so that's something that uh we've been trying it's really easy um really easy wait but under the hood right so in addition to having a ddx brick um that has yeah. that user entry you're also sending the data to app db sync now button so i assume you have that collection button. and this is just the uh ddx form and data set domo brick right so it's it, ddx it, form oh fantastic yeah, yeah it's called the form and data set or it's yeah form and data set and it's just like i'm again designer not a developer right you just come in here and uh you just add your own fields, right? And it just adds them and you just assign them a data type and it puts it into the collection nice. and then you just hit sync and this just creates a data set, right? Mm -hmm. So every, it's just taking the, what's in the collection, throwing it into a data set and then I'm using that to join up, right? Again, is this the way that I would build like a robust data pipeline that everybody should be using? Like, I don't know, right? Again, not a data engineer, but, <laughs> for doing what we needed to do to just try out some ideas and experiment with some concepts. Um, it's really, really useful. And again, this is so much more accessible to your end user. I mean, you can style this however you want using the HTML and CSS. Um, I can make this way more consumable to people. A, a good example of this is I have a bunch of case statements in Domo that fix things like Chris's name. Uh, you may not know this about Chris, but you know, everywhere in Domo, like in our HR data set stuff, his name is Christopher, right? How many of you have seen this uh, happen like day in, day out where it's like, oh, that's not, you know, Jay, it's really Jason or Jordan or whatever, um, Benjamin, right? But we all know him as Ben. Those are the things where you have to go in and like, okay, is it in a data flow? Like, where do I do this to map it up and make it look and feel like the people? And with this kind of solution, you can really say like, oh, when somebody comes in and has a weird name, I can add it here. And now I've got a lookup table that I can go in and join in and create, you know, the right uh, beast modes and stuff and have that pass through, um, which is really, really useful um, tool for me. So anyway, Domo, the platform, super powerful. So I can build on top of things and, try stuff out and like break things if you will but like figure out how to fix it um but then what we're trying to do is make it really easy as well and build on those tools and that's what you'll see with app studio and some of the other things that we're doing um one more little piece with that is just alerts that got brought up as well sometimes it's an alert this is an alert that i'm using personalized data permissions uh to let all of our designers know if they have a uh, project uh that they haven't checked in on so we have a thing where it's like every day i just want to journal what did i work on today what am i going to do tomorrow 
and people were having a hard time remembering to do journaling at four o'clock. So I just put a little data flow together where it took like the timestamp of their last journal entry, compared it against the current date, right? It runs that data flow every night at four o'clock. And at 4.15, you get a buzz message, text message, email, whatever you choose to subscribe, right? That says, hey, your last check-in was X number of hours ago. And then it has a hyperlink to the card where they can go in and or to our custom app that we built so people can do their journal entry. So lots of things like this. It just becomes a totally different experience uh, to let people interact with the data without it being a dashboard, right? Or a card or something else. So we presenters, sorry guys, I know it's, 10 minutes past the hour. If you guys want to hang out for a little bit and talk a little bit more and posit some questions or exchange ideas, love to continue this conversation. But again, Rachel, Chris, Jason, Devin, thank you. Thank you so much for, for making the time to come hang out with us. Um, hope to have you back on the channel again. Yeah, That's this, was, this was excellent, so Jay. Thanks, thanks for setting this up. This was great. Oh my gosh, yeah, Chris, thank you such so a much. pleasure to have you. Oh man, I love it. Thank you. I love it.